Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And this is entitled, The Fall of Man. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch of it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some of it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, and as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the, to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing, and with pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until it's returned to the ground, since it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Our second passage is now is in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, starting at verse, chapter, verse 2, and we're going to read all the way to chapter 4, to verse 20. Exodus chapter 3, starting with verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him within the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hezerites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to Israelites and say to them, 
the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? And what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned it back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. Now put it back into your cloaks, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am as slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if you were his. Be, excuse me, will be as if he were your mouth, and as if you were God to him. But take the staff in your hand, so you can perform miraculous signs with it. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, "Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive." Jethro said, "Go. I wish you well." Now the Lord got. Now the Lord had said to Moses. In Median, go back to Egypt, for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons and put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. Our final passage is in Romans chapter 13, 1 through 7. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. This is entitled, Submission to Authorities. Everyone must submit to himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that that exist have been established by God. Consequently, 
He who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has, has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on others for themselves. For rulers hold on no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but because of, but also because of consequences. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. That's our scripture reading this morning. Is there a children's church? Okay, children, this is time to be dismissed. Thanks, Barry. Hi. I'm glad you're here. You're welcome here. <clears throat> the title for my message today is Who's the Boss? Have you ever wondered that? Maybe your experience with bosses has been good. Maybe it's been bad. Maybe you're a little confused about uh, bosses. Maybe you'd like to be boss. You ever been a boss? <laughs> Hod, you've never been a boss? <laughs> oh, your wife's the boss. Oh, okay. Well, uh, may I present to you this morning that the Lord God Almighty is the boss. Now, isn't it interesting that we started out not liking that? Not respecting that. Not honoring that. Not obeying that. What he, the boss, asks us to do, we didn't do. <laughs> We rebelled. Isn't it strange that the Lord of the universe, the almighty God, the creator of all things, asked us to do something as simple as not eating an apple, if that's what it was. And we couldn't handle that. We had to go eat the apple. <laughs> Don't you find that kind of funny? It is kind of funny. But it's horatiously tragic. That even in the beginning, God gave us a free will whereby we may disrespect the boss. Rebel against the boss. You know, I was high school principal for two years. That was long enough. 
I didn't have any trouble with the kids. I had trouble with the boss. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That boss would get up in a meeting of the bosses, principals, and he would say things that I thought were so ridiculous, so untrue, I had to open my mouth and tell him so. I know whereof I speak when I say I can have no respect for a boss. And I also know the problems that bosses have getting respect from their teachers. There are teachers here. Do you respect your principal? There are people of the community here. Do you respect your board of education? We don't even do that today. The devil has figured out a way, slithering along the ground, eating dust, to make us so we have adversary relationships between the very people that can do the most for us. Who's the boss? Who's the boss? Maybe you've never been a boss and you'd like to be. <laughs> well, let me tell you one thing. It isn't what it put up to be. Being a boss isn't an easy thing. You have to make decisions that people don't like. Really. A teacher came in to me one morning and she said, Mr. Carlson, I have a complaint. I said, what is it? She said, somebody has backed out of the parking lot and hit the back fender of my car and made a crease in the back fender. And I'm upset. I said, well, I would hope so. Let's go out and look. Take a look. So we did. And there was one teacher in that high school who could have done that because her car was of such a color and such a height that it could do it. And nobody else had one like that. And I went and confronted that teacher, and if you didn't think I gave a problem a chance to happen, you're wrong. That teacher hated me until I left, and I'm sure she still does. It's a problem being a boss. And I can't help but wonder, I say this respectfully, I can't help but wonder if God really knew what he was doing when he made free will people. But you know he did. Because that is whereby he could find people who would respect and love him of their own free will. And that's the only way he could get it. Why are you here this morning? Because you love the Lord. You respect the Lord. You honor the Lord. You try to obey the Lord. You found it good to do that. You see... Our basic nature is what really battles this. And I start out with my basic nature when I was about one and a half years old. So did you. That baby just walked out of here. Has a basic nature. She wants what she wants when she wants it. 
Thank you very much. Isn't that right, Grandma? And she will continue being that way. She won't stop. The older she gets, the more clever she'll get because she wants her own. She really does want to be boss. We all really do want to be boss of what? Our own life. And you know what's funny? A lot of us think we are. <laughs> Let's all laugh. There isn't a better way to make a fool of yourself than to think you're the boss of your own life. But I think a lot of you do. There are at least sections of your life where you think you're the boss. And there are places, parts of your life, where you need to be the boss. You need to take command. You do need to command your body to do such and such. But don't expect me to obey your boss, e ideas and commands. That would be hard for me to do. Why? Because I want to be boss. So do you. If you don't think we want to be boss, just ask somebody to change their diet. They'll flare up for you like uh, towards you like gas on a fire. Don't tell me what to eat. Who's boss? Who's boss? You know, Adam and Eve found out that the boss was right. That his word was true. And they, when he went, they went against it, he did what he told them he'd do. There's the door. And honey, you aren't coming back. Because if you try, you'll meet an angel that's got a sword in his hand, and you won't walk through that door. It's over, folks. Out the door. You mean this boss has authority? Oh, does that come along with bosses? Oh, maybe we haven't thought about that very much. Do you think bosses have authority? Well, they might have. <laughs> might have. The boss I'm talking about doesn't have any problem with that. And if we think he does, we're fooling ourselves. He has all kinds of authority. Moses had quite a tangle with him. Moses decided to take things in his own hands, you know, it didn't work too good, so he ran away. Spent the next 40 years running around the desert trying to hide. And then he saw a burning bush. Oh, my. Oh, my. The Lord said, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. You just walked into authority. Where I'm boss. And I'm going to ask you to go down to Pharaoh and ask him to let my people go. And Moses thought within himself, you've got to be kidding. You think I'm going to go down and ask that Pharaoh? A man of his stature? His authority? His power? He's got armies he can run. You expect me to go down there and do that? I can't do that. Oh, your folks, uh, <laughs> I mean, your people won't even believe me. If I go down there and say that I came from, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Mo, they'll say, what are you talking about? We don't know who you are. Some of them will know him because they saw him kill that Egyptian. You're a murderer, that's who you are. You aren't going to tell us what to do. 
You're a mess. How do we know who you are? God said, well, I'll show you a few tricks. Maybe you'll believe me. Throw down your stick. Put your hand in your shirt. Really, you can do that? Yeah, I can do that. Well, maybe you have authority. I, 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 I can't talk, Lord. You can't talk? Who do you think gave you your voice? You think, I don't know, you can't talk? I knew before you said it because I've got Aaron already coming up here. I knew you'd deny that. And when you get together, go, I'm not messing with you. I said, go to Egypt, and I meant it. And Moses went. Because he had just an inkling of an idea that God meant what he said. (laughs) Imagine that. He caught a glimpse of the authority of God. And may I be truthful and tell you that he's your boss. He's not only your boss, he's the boss of this church. He's not only the boss of this church, he's the boss of this community. He's the boss of this state. He's the boss of this country. He's the boss of this world. No, lawyer, you are really dingy now. He's no more the boss of the, I mean, how can the world be doing what it's doing? Well, how do I know? I'm not the boss. I figured that out quite a while ago. I'm not the boss. And it isn't my place, a piece of clay, to say to him that formed me, why have you made me thus, or why are you doing what you're doing? Oh, but God can't do mean things. Oh, you think he can't? Read the Old Testament. You think God is just loving and mamby-pamby? Read the Old Testament. You think God doesn't deal with evil? Read the Old Testament. You think that God doesn't do with evil in your life? Look at it. Now, praise God, he's also loving and kind. But he's very concerned with your welfare... And therefore, he's your boss. He cares about you. He's the kind of a boss that knows what's coming down, and he is going to walk with you through it. Now, why does he let what's coming down come down? Because he knows that's what you need in your life. Argue with me until you see the sun go down. But that's the truth. We have something good to go by like this morning. Did you see this morning's blue sky? That's good, wasn't it? We say, God, you're good today. That's what we say, you know, and we say, boy, that blue sky was good. That's God. He cares about you. He cares about you so much that he has set up governments. Countries, governments, communities, churches, just for us. There isn't anything that proves to me the existence of God 
more than the fact that any place on earth you go, you will find laws to live by. That's a sociation. I had to put that in the right gear. Sociologically, it's something. It's a fact. You can't go anywhere and not find laws to live from. Now, you think those laws are right? He didn't say I'd, I didn't ask you if you thought those laws are right. I just happen to know they are. What? All the way from saying 35 miles an hour is the speed limit, because above that speed you can very possibly hit a deer instead of slow down. You might hit one anyway. But you're a lot more liable if you're going 65 or 70. Hit a child. Hit a little dog. There's a reason for 35 mile an hour speed limit. We set it up for your good. Do you like it? No, I don't care if you like it or not. It's for your good. Ooh. Ooh, I don't like that. Really? I struggle with that. I don't know about you. I struggle under local authority. I need to re-read Romans 13 every once in a while. And realize that my position under God is humility. My position under God is humility. Yes, Lord. First time I heard that chorus. I was at a prayer summit, and the black preacher from Spokane sang it, and I'll never forget it. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. That's the answer to give to Jesus. That's the answer to give to God. I don't care what's happening to you. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Do I like it? No, I don't like it. Does it hurt? Yes, it hurts. Do I think I failed? Yes, I do. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Make me a servant. We'll sing that in a little bit. Make me a servant, Lord. Give me the experiences that it helps to break down my ego. Break down my false pride. Break down the most ridiculous feeling I can have, and unfortunately I have it quite often, that I'm the boss. Help me to be responsible. But help me to remember that I'm the boss, not the boss. God's the boss. So every morning I wake up and I say, Lord, I'm willing to do what you want me to do today. I accept the fact that you're the boss. I accept the fact that you love me. I accept the fact that you hate evil in me. I accept the fact that you have a lot of things that needs to be done in this world to help people. And I'm lazy. I'm not very prone to do that. I kind of take care of my own stuff and let everybody else go. 
Lord, I'm willing. I give this day to you. And you do with me whatever you want to be done. I owe you the honor of of us. I respect you, O Lord. I bow before you, O Lord. The knowledge of your being the boss and your sovereignty has shattered my ego. Has shattered my false feeling of authority. I thank you, Father, for our community. I thank you, Father, for our church. I thank you, Father, for my home, for my place, all of these wonderful gifts that you've given to me. I thank you, Father, for the privilege of knowing you, even as boss. Help me to realize more and more the consequence of knowing that. We love you, Lord, because as far as we know, you are a kind and loving boss. And when you need to be strict and disciplining, you are with us and you walk with us. What a boss. Even when we enter those gates, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even when we cross that river Jordan into the promised land, you're with us. All the way, my Savior leads me. All the way, my boss leads me. Help me, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.